Sachaka Talk, Artist Residency in the Amazon Rainforest, Peru. Hi, I'm Trina Brammer, and with us here today is a very special guest, Erin Laurie. Erin came to visit us um, 10 years ago, and she was one of our first artists. We hadn't even built um, the art centre in the mountain at that point. We were renting uh, studio space in the village. So I've been following Erin for, for many years and um, yeah, just very, very excited to, I'm always very excited to find out more about her process and and what goes into her work. Um, so I'm like a little kid here. <laughs> so I hope that you, um, We'll enjoy this, the amazing work of Erin Laurie. So we'll start off where we should always start off is where are you from and what is your background and um, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your art career there, which is a very amazing art career that you have um, there in Canada. So I'll let you, you begin. Hi, Trina. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for that great introduction, Trina. It's truly an honor to be on this podcast. Um, our friendship has grown in interesting ways over the years, and you always inspire me to be a better person than artist and to be a more honest person than artist. So I'm really happy that we're going to have this conversation. Um, so I am an artist. I'm based in Toronto, uh, Canada. And I grew up in a small town a few hours east of here. And I moved here to go to school to do my undergrad uh, to get my BFA in drawing and painting in 2007. So I've been here ever since. And um, I love it, but you know, it's, uh, it's getting to be time for me to leave. So I'll, I'll reconsider that when the time comes. But um, I've been interested in art for as long as I can remember, I think as old as as I could hold it ever since I could hold a crayon basically um that side of me was nurtured from my dad and my mom my dad's a musician and an artist and we used to draw for hours on the floor on Bristol board and he taught me how to see the world and to translate that into my drawings and he also was very interested in humor and he used to draw lots of cartoons and caricatures so I think I learned how to um to be a bit well, very imaginative in that way as well. So I had some great artistic influences um, from my family and my aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody. Um, but basically for my whole life, until my last year of my undergrad at OCAD, I did realistic, anatomically correct drawings. And so the thing was, back, up until that point, I had made sure to plan everything. There was absolutely no room for spontaneity, for chance, for any kind of um, evolution in my process. And it was really stifling and it felt very uh, limiting. So I spent a few years in extreme discomfort trying to move out of that. And, but I was still incorporating the figure to some degree, even though I was, you know, trying to place the figures in some, you know, more interesting, abstract, painterly, amorphous uh, backgrounds or landscapes, but I hadn't quite let go of the figure yet. And so what ended up happening was a couple of days before my last year at, at in my undergrad, which is obviously the most important year because you're supposed to make a body of work that's cohesive and based on research. And I broke my third metatarsal just a few days before that year started. So everything that I thought was gonna happen just went totally out the window and I had to learn to rely on help for literally everything. And it was super, super uncomfortable. Um, you know, I couldn't get my own coffee or buy my own art supplies or stretch my own canvases or anything. And so what ended up happening that year was um, because my bone didn't heal either. I was, I think it was like, I was too stressed out and, you know, university life. <laughs> but um, so I started painting dozens and dozens of these small self portraits which at first were very, uh, I was always using references at this time as well, I should mention that, but they were very tight and they were very, uh, I was always trying to achieve a kind of likeness of the person, of myself. 
And um, over time, as like emotions and tension had built up in me as a result of not being able to really express myself fully or move around physically, um, I started to loosen up a bit. And I was looking at a lot of artists that really use paint liberally and freely and were trying to capture like the essence of a person as opposed to their external appearance. So like artists like uh, Bacon, Arbach, Cecily Brown, George Kondo, um, to name a few. And then eventually like Alison Shulnick and Kim Dorland um, and Harold Klunder helped me to see the possibilities of using paint um, sculpturally. And as soon as I got my cast off, um, which was four months later, I felt this extreme sense of liberation. And that was the moment that I stopped using references and source material altogether. I actually still have the two paintings uh, from the last photo that I used. And so they're, they're really special to me because they mark that shift. But after that moment, my focus became about the process of painting. And so I think, you know, since then it started to become very apparent to me that there is for me at least such a value in the unknown and in uncertainty. And I never want to know what's going to happen with the paintings. So, or the, the work of art, whatever it may be. Um, I'm primarily an oil painter right now and I work out of a studio here in Toronto and um, the work, the work generates more work. So I never have references around me and each painting informs the next and each painting um, reveals to me different questions and different um, curiosities that I'm able to then um, grapple with in the, in the next painting. So they're all related and they're all connected by a thread that way. Um, so my work ever since then has become about, you know, not just the image, but also the surface and how the material itself can communicate meaning. Um, and so actually, one of my favorite artists, Kent, um, William Kentridge, he's a South African artist. Um, he talks about the uncertainty of images and how this is so much closer to how the world really functions. You can see the world as a series of photographs and facts, or you can see it as in a, an eternal or constant process of unfolding or becoming. And so this is this relates to the way that I see the world, um, which goes back to my first experiences um, in meditation, uh, I think it was in 2012. It was it was actually the summer right before I went to Sachaka. Um, and so I had never meditated. Um, and I went to this 10 day silent meditation retreat. Vipassana means to see things as they really are. And it's a way of self transformation through self observation. So it's really an, an inner journey. So you're not allowed to talk to anybody to look at anybody, to do exercises, to write in your journal um, for the entire 10 days. And you meditate for about 10 hours a day. So I totally dove into the deep end with that one. And um, what it showed me was that everything within me, in my body and in my mind is in a constant state of flux. So every sensation, you train yourself to become aware of every sensation as it arises and passes in your body and every thought that arises and passes in your mind and how the sensations and the thoughts and the emotions are interconnected. And so one leads to another inevitably through this um, constant like chain reaction. And basically what you begin to understand is that there is experientially within your own body and mind that everything is impermanent. And so because you see this within yourself, it's you can't help but recognize that that's how the universe functions. And even though we can't see it, you know, our senses are limited in that way, just like we can't see like the full spectrum of color, um, everything is vibrating, everything is moving, everything is changing, and there are no separate processes. Everything is connected to everything else. And it's this beautiful, seamless um, transition of matter, of energy. And so I really want my work uh, currently to reflect this this view of reality and I think that it inevitably does and how I achieve that is by working with the oil paint wet into wet and I'm constantly adding paint removing paint and so there's this on the surface of the panel or the canvas itself this recycling and renewing of 
of the paint, of material, of energy, of form, of meaning. And so I love that the meaning is in, in, also in a constant state of change. Um, and it's revealed to me as I move through the process and afterwards um, in reflection. And sometimes the meaning of the work doesn't even reveal itself to me until years later. Um, and I, I love that actually about the process because if I knew what was going to happen or what it was going to what it was going to mean, then there's no there's really no reason to do it in my in my personal opinion. Um, and I think that my experience at Sachaka and in the rainforest also helped inform this view of of the world for me. Um, it was the first time that I had ever been surrounded by nature for so long that I really got a chance to witness the cycles. Uh, the cycles of life and death, birth, decay, growth, renewal, all of these different, um, you know, processes in the natural world. And I saw those as reflected in my, my, in my mind. So there was this sort of um, interesting synchronistic uh, events happening externally and internally, which I think I, I carry that, this sort of awareness into my practice as well. Um, yeah. So it's really hard to know where to start here. I, you have done an enormous amount of work, Erin. I just, it's just amazing how, how hard you have worked. But I have stumbled across 2012 series. Um, and it's, it's, and, you know that all of those pieces each one are just so powerful um and so could you go through um the different work from that 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 time and um and tell tell us more so about what was going on in your life through each painting so that we can live your experience through those paintings? Because it seems like it was quite a transformative time. Yeah, so the um, 2012, you know, on my website even, that's the, the very first year that I've uploaded artwork. And to me, it feels like the big, it was the, it was the beginning of this long, eternal, transformational journey that I've that I have been on and continue to embark on day after day. Um, like I said, 2012 was the beginning of my, uh, a new chapter creatively, um, personally, where I began to embrace uh, the process as opposed to the outcome of something. And so surrendering to the unknown, um, and so the pieces in the 2012 series, uh, I called that series Inner Strangers. And to me, what it, what it was really about was, it was a personal journey of finding a way through painting of externalizing different fragments and undigested, unresolved aspects of my own experience um, and translating them into paintings and often strange and humorous and, whimsical um, characters. But to me, at, at this time, I, I was really going through um, some, some serious darkness within me. And I think that a lot of, um, you know, experiences that I had managed to compartmentalize and avoid for basically, you know, my entire life were beginning to surface. So this was a and extremely uncomfortable, um, which is often a part of the transformative uh, process, of course, the beginning of it, um, extremely, extremely dis uncomfortable, um, but the paintings, they healed me. And so I used a lot of really bright, um, vivid colors to communicate something that I felt was a bit darker uh, in subject matter. And all of the paintings from 2012, they, most of them are either vertical format, which um, mirrors the, the body. So you can see this sort of from head to foot, the sort of flow of brush strokes and energy and movement going from top to bottom to back again. And then there are a bunch of these, diff like I said, smaller um, self-portraits that 
you know, are often just showing like the bust or the head uh, in some very loose and abstract interpret interpretive way. Um, and so I think at this point, especially with the portraits, the straight up portraits of, of heads, you can see that, you know, the head is situated on a very hazy, um, luminous uh, gradation of colors in the background, a so soft diffused background. And the head itself, the shape of the head is full of thick interwoven strokes of paint. And it's very messy, it's very chaotic. And what I think was happening at this time was that I was very, I was very caught up and I was entangled in my own thought processes and I wasn't as connected to the body. Um, I was in my head and I was trying to get out. And you can see, so there's a lot of, in the portraits, there's a lot of like spill out of paint, of color, of material. Um, so that's kind of what I think happened there. Like there's a painting called Sooner or Later, which it depicts a sort of darker foreboding figure with a just a dark face set against this bright orange background. And you can see spilling out of this character's heart, all of this like black sludgy uh, liquid. And so the title sooner or later, it just it speaks to the emotions and experiences that we suppress or that become repressed. Uh, the inevitability of of that um, of the outpouring of that of the the coming out of that and in in often unpredictable untimely ways. Um, so yeah, this was this entire series was extremely meaningful to me. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, that painting dissolution um, was inspired by my experiences in meditation where you feel this sort of rushing of energy through the body and you you literally feel the physical body dissolve. And so this series was really all about the um, letting go of an identity, grappling with the, um, the grief and the separation that's felt in that sense. So, you know, even before this series, I was doing a lot of drawings where and paintings where you you would actually see heads or bodies ripping apart from one another, and it looks quite painful, and it is psychologically painful. Um, so this was the beginning of my uh, honestly my spiritual journey and my my journey to self awareness and self knowledge. So these paintings are very 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 special. There's also a piece in this series called Purge, and it's a like dragon like character in the center of the painting it's five by four feet and you see these strokes coming out of the mouth and then there's a sort of um i i used to drag a dry brush through the painting spiraling out and around uh the central form so it looks very um very uh like you're unsettled and you're wheezy and you're it's like you're unable to see clearly and there's this disorientation about this image and you see that that brush and that spiraling of strokes happening a lot in in my earlier works um there's also i'm reading this book right now and it like i said the meaning of the work often emerges years later and like 10 or 11 years later i'm seeing this um or wait, eight years later, nine years later. Anyways, I'm coming to new understandings about this work. And so I'm reading this book right now called No Boundary by Ken Wilber. And so he talks about how we are multidimensional beings and that we are operating on and inhabiting different aspects and levels of consciousness at all times. And so, for example, if, if you're asked the question, who are you? How do you respond to that? And the way that you respond depends on the state of consciousness that you are inhabiting in that moment. So he talks a lot about um, the rainbow spectrum of consciousness, which is clearly um, relating to the chakras, the, the lower to the upper chakras. And basically um, how you would answer that question, who are you, depends on where you draw the self, not self boundary line. So a really common um, boundary line for the self, not self is the 
um, the outer boundary of the organism, so the skin. So whatever is outside of the organism is considered not you. It's considered foreign. It's considered other. And then within the body, you could draw the boundary line between the body and the mind so that you are your mind, but you're not your body. And you see people with um, often like illnesses and diseases relating to themselves this way because they feel like the disease is something foreign. It's attacking them. So there's this divide within their within their body in that sense. And then even within their minds, within their own psyches, they can draw the boundary line between different aspects of the self that you uh, accept and don't accept or that you reject and that you don't reject. So um, there's this compartmentalization within the self and it just depends on where you draw the line. That line is also very fluid and flexible and it's constantly being redrawn, again, based on the state of consciousness that you're embodying in that moment. And then, you know, there's the experience of unity consciousness, which is often that's off i mean that can be triggered in multiple different uh many different ways like through meditation or through taking psychedelics or creating an artwork or um in intimate relationships but that's basically where you see yourself as one with the entire universe and in that situation the boundary line actually dissolves so what i realized about the series called inner strangers um, and Ken Wilber actually used that phrase, inner strangers, to describe the parts of yourself that you are not willing to or able to confront or look at. Um, and he talks about, too, which I find so fascinating, this um, idea that wherever you draw a boundary, a boundary line is also a potential battle line. So whenever you have something and it's other or something that's foreign, there's a possibility of conflict, possibility of battle. And so there is a possibility of disease, dis-ease or disharmony. Um, so anyways, I just found that like, it just added a whole new layer of meaning to that series for me. So because my work is never planned, um, what's most important to the, the artwork itself is that I live as interesting and full a life as possible. Um, because it's inevitable that everything that I experience, I see, that I smell through my senses and I feel, all of this gets filtered through my unique lenses and then comes through the work organically. And so I love that painting is such an opportunity for us to um, confront and become aware of our own tendencies and habits and our unconscious mind and not just that but like the universal consciousness I think so much comes through in the painting process if you allow it um, and that's where the real magic happens you know I've tried to plan certain things and I've tried to create series um, and I've introduced some constraints at different points in my practice but the truth is the best work always comes from a place of total allowance total surrender and that doesn't mean that it's easy. Of course, there are many, many, many times when I struggle for days and months with a painting, but um, at the same time as there is that struggle, there is this overarching sense of like, um, yeah, allowing and conversing with the painting, allowing it to tell me what it needs. And so there's this, actually Ellen, one of the other artists at Sachaka, um, she has a podcast you can listen to. She talked to me one time about, she told me the story about the inner life of the painting. And ever since she told me that story, it's just solidified this idea in my mind that each painting has its own sort of like spirit. It's a really mystical thing. And I think that each painting is its own universe. It's its own entity. And although it is just a, uh, one piece of the greater whole, of the greater puzzle, um, they are their own um, contained uh, universe and they speak to me in very different ways. And so I'm always learning from my process and that's, you know, as soon as I stop learning from the paintings, that's when it's time to move on or time to change something. But um, I think that, yeah, it's all about openness and re receptivity. Your larger work are always so impressive. Um, 
I mean, it's so much different working large than it is from uh, a small painting. And I know there's some quite uh, lots of technical um, difficulties that you have with working large. Um, but what I'd like to speak about as well as um, how how you achieve a painting which is uh, 48 by 96 inches and you have... Um, you know, which is 244 centimetres, because I work in centimetres. And then you have one here that's it's, it's, it's 180 uh, inches uh, long, which is qu it's quite, um, it's quite a large uh, painting. So first of all, I'd like to talk about that, you know, like how, how, how you um, manage to paint such great work and then get it to the gallery because I know that you even have issues getting it inside the gallery because it's so big and uh, can you also share with us your preparation drawings that is connected so we'll start off with um, the looking glass um, and and we'll should we dissect this painting the the, the looking glass and can we talk about um also you were sharing that you actually write as you're painting and I wondered if you had any written work in your sketchbook that you um, can help us to understand a little bit about your process. So yeah the process of making a small painting as you know is so much different than making a large one and I am an, uh, the type of painter that likes to switch things up quite often so I'll you know, move from making like a an eight by ten inch painting to an eight by ten foot painting, one after the other. Um, because the the reason is because I I prefer not to get too comfortable with any process or uh, method of making my work, and I really really acknowledge the importance of being a beginner. Um, and there's different ways that I uh, can kind of get to that place and switching up the scales from small to large to medium to back again is uh, one of the ways that I that I keep my practice feeling fresh but um yeah I mean with the larger paintings like for, I they're my favorite ones like I they're my favorite ones to look at and they're my favorite ones to make because um it's such an immersive experience and it has to do with the entire body um the smaller paintings, you know, you can just move your arm around. You can, it, it, the range of motion isn't really important. It can have a lot to do with just like the flick of a wrist, really. Um, like the gesture that inhabits a small painting takes up so much more space. And so I'm all, but I am always trying to, even when I move from a small to a large, to have the painting appear to have come into being all at once. And obviously on a larger scale, um, I have to work in the way that I approach larger paintings. I, I work in sections. So, for example, I'll typically work on start the painting on the far right hand side and then begin to move inwards towards the left. And then I'll just suddenly jump over to the far left. And then what I'm left with is this space in between. And then I have to figure out how to connect these seemingly disconnected sections. And I love trying to create um, what appears to be like a linear narrative in the work, but it's actually made up in fragments and in parts and non-linearly. And so the way that I achieve this sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the feeling that everything was made at one time is that I work wet into wet in each section so that I am sort of creating this sort of like loose, um, uh, where you see forms, you can't really tell where one form ends and one begins and that's just because of the way that I've applied paint um and so yeah I have to scale my tools up I have to use like um I I, I work with a lot of screen printing squeegees all different types and styles and sizes of brushes and I'll sometimes um attach brushes together to make a larger brush or I'll make my own uh squeegees out of rubber and old broom handles Sometimes I have to build tables to stand on. Um, for a painting that I did recently, for, for my most recent show, um, it was the largest piece that I had ever done. And it was 
it was made up in two panels because I just couldn't fit it out of the door. So it had to come in two sections, but it was one, one um, image. Uh, but that painting was uh, nine feet tall by 15 feet long. And I had to, I had to set up scaffolding. So the process of making that painting was very different than making say like a four by eight like a 48 by 96 inch like you were just talking about Trina um I'm super comfortable on a 48 by 96 because everything is in my range of motion like my you know I might have to step to the side a little bit more to reach one side of the painting and to and then to go to the next but everything is within standing reaching distance pretty much but for a large one that like I was just talking about you have to it's very stop and go and it's very physically taxing and demanding and um like for example i'll have to stand down there's a lot of looking and contemplation between the actions which i also find interesting that you just don't really get when you're looking at a completed painting like how much time there is between some of the brush strokes um so i'll sit there and look at the painting until i sort of figure out what the next move is. And then I'll have to get up on the scaffolding, make a few marks, then get back down, then get back on, and get back down, then get back on, then get back down. And it's very, very different than making a, like what I consider a medium, medium to large, <laughs> which is that 48 by 96 range. Um, but yeah, the experience of making a large one to me is just so, it's so much more challenging, but it's so much more rewarding and uh, I, I love it because, you know, on a large surface, you can really see that there are many little paintings within one painting. So I like to consider each section as the possibility of being its own little painting. Um, and, you know, like literally painting some, something, painting something literally large and literally small on the same surface is, is really, really exciting about working on a large panel. Um, so yeah, so to, 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 I pack up all my own paintings. I build all of my own, um, I build wooden corners that have spacers uh, on the edge because a lot of the paint that I use sort of wraps around the edges of the panels. So, um, and because oil takes forever to dry, I don't wanna squish it. So I have to build these wooden corners. So I'm basically building frames around every single painting. And that's what I do with the large paintings as well. And then I'll often put like a, a cage of strips of wood on the front and then I'll put cardboard over it. So I'm making like its own little box um, where nothing can touch the front of it. So it's very, the packing process is very extensive. It's very time consuming and, um, but it's just a part of, you know, I just have to accept it because that's just the only way to transport the, the paintings that I make that are pretty much like sculptures. Um, yeah, and also like the idea of working large too, um, there's always that consideration of materials. And because I use paint so liberally, I really have to be uh, okay with, um, you know, putting everything into my work. Like I literally put everything into it. All my money, all my energy, all my love, all my care, all my attention. And so, um, you know, I'm never really feeling like it's a waste or a risk because it just, it needs that. Like without, for me personally, without that material, that those globs and that, like the possibility of working with a paint sculpturally, I just feel like it's, la it lacks some kind of physical presence. And what I want in a painting is for it to feel like there's like a presence of a person or a spirit in the room with you. Um, so yeah, um, you mentioned Looking Glass. Uh, that's It's funny that you mentioned that painting. I love that painting. Um, it was actually a commission, interestingly enough. And um, But the way that I do commissions typically is uh, I'll take some direction in terms of maybe if they wanted to give me direction uh, or input in terms of the color palette or maybe the amount of texture or something kind of open like that but I always tell the client that I don't know what's going to happen and they have to be okay with that I because for commissions I want to be able to make a piece that I would just naturally make on my own anyways um I guess you know the main the main restriction I would have would just be the size of the 
the size and shape of the panel um, that is going to obviously fit in their the, the desi desired location. But um, yeah, I don't like I, I think I might have mentioned that I don't. Uh, oh, no, I don't think I mentioned it. Well, I don't use references or source material. So it's all just coming out of my my head, my own experience, and the work is inspired by previous work that I've done. So there's no preparatory sketch that goes into uh, my work. Typically, once in a while, I'll do, I'll do a sketch if I really want to get something right, and it is uh, very specific, but that's very rare. So for Looking Glass, the only element that I knew that I wanted to have in the painting was um, on the left, you can see this like bright white um, diffused, you could see it as either a moon or you could see it as like a frame. You could see the the white as like negative space um, or, or a moon. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to have that contrast of light and dark in that one area. And I felt like that would sort of set the stage for the rest of the paintings. So that's what I started with. Um, and I approach different areas of the painting very differently. So that um, that section was just like a la prima, paint on, that's it. But then right below the white moon, you can see that I've done uh, like a, a more rainbow multicolored underpainting. And then I've layered lots of paint over top of that. And then I've taken a squeegee and removed the section and cut out paint. And then so you see that the rainbow um, underpainting has been stained by the paint that was on top of it. And so there's this like very beautiful, fluid, multicolored section. Um, and then there's a hand on the right hand side that uh, it the hand is created by a lot of um, oil paint that's been diluted with uh, some solvents. And so it's very washy, it's very thin. And the white of the panel is glowing through um, that wash. And so the reason why I painted a hand there was that, so, oh yeah, so so again, going back to the moon, that moon has been uh, incorporated in many different paintings of mine, in many different ways, in many different colors, but it is a recurring motif. And so that's where that that area came from. And then the hand, previous to doing this painting, I had painted a very large uh, landscape format painting called Fantasia and accidentally painted a hand whole, that appeared to be picking up a ball. And the hand was this giant hand that was coming down from the top of the panel, uh, occupying a large, large section of the painting. So it actually looked like the hand of God or like some larger than life being playing with this ball. So I wanted to, the hand in this painting was done a lot more consciously, but it was inspired by what had happened just by chance in the previous painting. Um, and then, yeah, so then I'll treat some different sections, uh, like the bottom right hand corner of looking glass. It looks almost like another otherworldly little landscape with like a planet um, floating in the air. And then there's to the uh, above that in the upper right hand section, you can see what might be considered like a pyramid or a, a triangle shape of some sort and the sky and some clouds. And then it looks like the hand is trying to grab um, some kind of interesting, uh, maybe otherworldly, other, you know, extraterrestrial like spaceship or a pool or some kind of vessel and then you see what appears now to me as a, a dragon head a water dragon head coming through the hole of that vessel um maybe speaking something to speaking it appears to be like communicating over to the left so there's this uh I want all of the elements of every section of the painting to be speaking to each other. Um, but the way that I like to paint is that there are all these different, again, seemingly disconnected sections, but they do relate to each other and they connect either through um, association or color or 
through liter literally moving from one, one paint from one section to another to create the other section. Um, and so I want it to feel very playful. And so that's kind of how this painting evolved. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, it's all very organic. It's all very improvised. Um, and like I said, I really want the painting to surprise me. And this one definitely did. Also, can you um, talk a little bit about Tangled Garden as well? And um, also, um, you know, I'd like to show the, the process through your s sketchbook and any writing you have about that painting also. Um, it seems a very uh, positive painting and um, yes, I, I, yeah, it's very innocent that painting, I see it as, it's very light and innocent. Um, so yeah, if you could just talk a little bit about the Tangled Garden, please, which is very large as well. How big is it? So the Tangled Garden was the first painting that I'd ever made in response to another painting. Um, this painting was inspired by J.E.H. McDonald's piece, The Tangled Garden. Um, McDonald was one of the key figures in establishing the Group of Seven in the early part of the 20th century. And his painting, The Tangled Garden, is so... It's hard to explain the feeling that this painting evokes in me, but it's like this giant mass of what appeared to be like tangled plants and flowers and they're, they don't look pretty or beautiful like you would typically expect to see flowers or a garden painted in, at that time um and there's this the dom like the predominant plant in the painting is this sort of like big drooping sunflower that to me he feels like i i feel like it's like a character and it's sort of like weighed down and it's uh, feeling the weight of something. Um, but I just, I saw it, so this painting feels both playful and light, but also dark and unruly to me, which I think is, those are really the two sides of nature that I, that I hope to express when I'm working with, you know, the subject of the landscape or plant, plant life. Um, and so, my painting, The Tangled Garden, is a an inspiration. It's kind of like a, I would say that I'm leaning more towards the light and playful. Like you said, it's innocent. It's kind of childlike. There are a lot of pastel, bright, playful colors, um, but it's not as dense. Like the visually, there's a lot of space between the different forms. Um, and I think that what I was trying to do in this painting and also in my life was have uh, was return to a sense of childlike wonder and innocence. So like as a child, we had um, the woods near my house that I used to walk through every single day. And I would always find new and unworn pathways to take. So I was always in search of adventure. I was always closely observing every single blade of grass, tree, bug, bird, I was always on the lookout for salamanders. And so there was always this immediacy of the moment and allowing them and, and really deciding to see the magic in the everyday in nature. And this painting to me was sort of reactivating that quality in myself and Although like you do see like the central in the very middle of this painting is some kind of dark burgundy, purple, violet, um, these masses of strokes of paint overlaid on top of what I've talked about is the, is the, the rainbow underpainting. So the rainbow again represents the inner life, the the eternal unchanging nature of something the magic behind the veils and so you see this sort of like multi-dimensional creature in the center and then to the far right you see a lot of these different types of flowers and plants and 
it's starting to appear a little bit dense in the far left hand corner. So, and a lot of the strokes in this painting are really trying to mimic the types of very free, loose scribbles of a marker um, or a crayon. And I think that you can get a sense of that. There's a lot of um, like very organic shapes and strokes and spirals and, um, and yeah, so there are a lot of primary colors in this painting, a lot of secondary colors, but it's very, it, it feels like it's speaking to children or at least like the, the childlike aspect in, in someone, in the person who's looking at this painting. I started a writing practice um, to complement my art practice about a year ago, and it's proven to be the missing ingredient in, in my process. And so I wanted to have a deeper connection to each individual painting. So I started writing about each individual painting mostly just um, intuitive stream of consciousness from first person. And I think that I've had in the past uh, a huge block in terms of writing about my work because I always tried to write, you know, in third person academically in this like very structured way. And at some point I realized that that technique of writing and that way of describing the work didn't reflect the way that I actually make my paintings and so I've just given that up and I've embraced my own um, my own unique language and tone and the way that I um, well basically what's been happening is that I've been discovering as much in the writing process about the works as I did while making them so I now see the writing as not just complementary to the work, but I see it as an extension of the work. And there's so much more that can be discovered and revealed through language. It is a, literally a different language than painting. Um, so that's, that's where I'm at right now. And um, I think that each painting like, has something to say. And I'm, I'm trying to open up the channels to allow it to speak through me in a way. So I'll just read you a, a piece of writing that I wrote about a painting called Follow Closely. So this piece was made with the idea of the magic hour in mind. Landscape, inscape, interior, expressions of that rich interior life. Black silhouettes sit in front of the hot, fiery setting sun. These black shapes are mysterious, shape-shifting, morphing into different forms. They are playful and moving together, dancing together, swaying together. You get a sense that the whole scene is breathing as one organism. Inhale, exhale, a continuous exhale. They are playful and primal, calling out to you, to me, summoning me to come closer to merge with the darkness. The darkness that feels at once so consuming is just one side of the coin, one point of perception. The dark masses you see are, si the dark masses you see are si simultaneously illuminated by the bright light of the sun on the flip side. Silhouettes have a backside or a front side. Why have I never considered this before? We see only the blackness of the shadows, the light screaming out from behind the shapes and creeping in from their edges. And somehow I've always only thought about this one side. It is one way of looking at things. The darker the darks, the lighter the lights. The darker things appear from this perspective, the brighter the brights on the other side. You can only know the intensity of the light from the depth of the dark. You have to use your imagination. You have to know it's there. Duality, yin, yang, always shifting, always transforming into the other, each containing the seed of its other, of its backside. Ropes of rainbow light find their way through the foliage. They're vines, they're vines and creatures of the night. They're rainbow snakes slithering through the darkness, guardians of the jungle. They protect and worship the sun, the blue sun. The so, it's so hot, that blue, blue sun. How these silhouettes stir the imagination so profoundly and effortlessly. Ironically, it's only when we see things clearly that we begin to imagine something other than what we know. I think we're always hoping for something magical to appear and to take us away, to save us. The thing is, the magic is always there. It always has been, it always will be. You just have to switch the lens 
tapping back into that childlike, innocent view of the world. Paintings invite us to return to this state, and that's why I'm always returning to the studio. It's the most powerful way that I find this connection. And so that little bit of writing was just, um, I was allowing the paintings to, that particular painting to suggest its meaning to me. But I've also experimented with um, writing as if I am the painting speaking. So it's in that way, you can sort of tap into other, something other than what we might logically um, uh, see or find in the painting. Um, it's this other way of, of communicating as if you are that painting. What does it have to share? How does it feel? What is it trying to communicate? What does it need? Um, I like I like to play these games with writing and I, I'm excited because this is just the beginning of this beautiful, rich practice. Something I also want to mention is that I want the viewer to have the same experience looking at the painting as I do uh, when I look at it and also when I make it which is that ambiguity of the image is crucial. I want the painting to feel as if, or I want you to feel as if you're encountering a different work of art, a different painting uh, every time that you step up to it. I want it to shift as you shift, because obviously we're always just bringing our own unique psychological disposition to the conversation and you know again like speaking to that book that ken wilber wrote depending on the state of consciousness that you are uh, embodying and being and expressing from in that moment you will perceive everything outside of you differently so i mean all paintings all artwork everything in the world and the universe is always changing depending on your perception of it um but I really do want the viewer and me to have the same experience. And I think that's uh, important to note. To learn more about Erin's process and also learn about the world of plant medicine in Peru, please subscribe and like our YouTube channel. And we will see you again soon.